It's the same story really with all of our companies. We try and come up with what we call a central tendency of value. And if that central tendency of value is a lot higher than the current stock price, then it certainly is worth, uh, you know, we're taking a very serious look at it and, and maybe buying. On WealthTrack, great investor Bill Miller, the unconventional places he is finding value now on Consuelo Mac WealthTrack. Funding provided by ClearBridge Investments, Morgan Le Fay Dreams Foundation, First Eagle Investment Management, Royce Investment Partners, Matthews Asia, and Strategus Asset Management. Hello and welcome to this edition of WealthTrack. I'm Consuelo Mack. Over the years, we have tapped the wisdom of great investors, and one of them is Bill Miller, who is marking his 40th year in the investment business and rarely does television interviews. Miller is the founder and chief investment officer of Miller Value Partners, a firm he founded in 1999 while working at Leg Mason, but took over completely in 2017. He holds the unrivaled record of beating the S&P 500 for 15 consecutive years from 1991 to 2005 with the Leg Mason Capital Management Value Trust Fund. His flagship Miller Opportunity Trust Fund, which he created in 1999, has $2.5 billion in assets and has beaten the S&P 500 since inception, including in the vast majority of years since he turned bullish at the market's bottom in 2009. For more than a decade, Miller has been aided by Samantha McLemore, co-portfolio manager since 2014 and assistant portfolio manager since 2008. He recently told his shareholders that after four decades of doing so, he will no longer be writing the fund's quarterly letter, saying, over the past decade or so, my letters have been focused mostly on saying the same thing. We are in a bull market that began in March of 2009 and continues accompanied by the typical and inevitable pullbacks and corrections. That doesn't mean he is retiring from sharing his views when he sees fit or retiring from active management. Far from it. In fact, he joins us this week to discuss his current views on the market, strategy, and a wide range of other topics. And in another edition, he will be back to discuss what he is doing in his personal portfolio, where he can make more concentrated investments. Here's the headline for that discussion. Miller has gone really big on Bitcoin. Half of his personal net worth is now in the cryptocurrency and a few related investments. We look forward to that discussion. But first, this one, starting with his assessment of a market that many observers consider to be expensive. I, th I think that the market is roughly fairly valued, which means that you know, the, the central tendency of most stocks is to trade within some small band of what they're worth. And with a fairly valued market, you'll have a quadrant, uh, maybe a quartile that's very expensive and a quartile that's very cheap. And I think that's in the in 50 percent in the middle are fairly, fairly priced. I think one of the things that happens is that, you know, after after a number of years of the, of the market going going up and of a good economy and of interest rates being well behaved and earnings being at, at records, um, people people tend to associate that with an expensive market. And when the market is cheap, when it's really cheap, then they say there's too much risk and too much uncertainty. So they, I think there tends to be a schizophrenia where the market is never, uh, never offers to many observers any significant opportunity. It's either too risky or it's, or it's too expensive. <laughs> but to you, Bill Miller, um, it, you seem to always find things that you deem attractively valued or really way undervalued. In, in most markets, that's the case. 99, uh, 99 was a very expensive market, and that's what you know, ushered in three down years in a row for the first time since the, since the Great Depression. But I don't think this market is terribly expensive. There are some names in the very high growth uh, sphere, the, cl the cloud computing and software as a service, things like that. They're, they're, they're pretty expensive. In fact, some are very expensive, in my opinion. But uh, the, the, the big names in the market, you know, Apple and Amazon and Alphabet, Meta, Facebook, I don't think any of those stocks are particularly expensive. So I think, I think they'll all, they all offer good value. We, all, we own, I think, almost every one of them and, um, and have done and have for a long time. What's kind of the upside potential? Um, and let's start with Amazon, uh, which you've owned for a really long time. When people ask me the best investment decision I ever made, I say buying Amazon on the IPO. And what was the worst, ever selling a share of Amazon? Amazon is... Uh, it's underperformed the market uh, fairly significantly in the, in the past 12 months. And that's because they're going through a, a very large capital spending cycle. 
and the market then isn't sure if they're going to earn above the cost of capital, even though they always have done that in the past. But what's interesting about Amazon particularly, so, so you know, something like Alphabet's had a, had a great year, and Amazon not so great. But what's interesting about Amazon to me is that if you mark the a AWS business, the Amazon Web Services business, to a blend, blended multiple of its major competitors in that area, such as, uh, or software as a service, such as um, Microsoft, Microsoft or uh, uh, Salesforce.com, then what you'll find is that AWS alone is worth almost Amazon's current market cap. We, we think AWS standalone business is worth about $1.5 trillion. And then the advertising business, which is growing much faster than the advertising business at, at, at Meta and at, uh, and at Alphabet, if you give them the average price to sales that those companies trade at, then that gets you about 95% of the way, almost 100% of the way, to Amazon's current market value. So you get the entire global retail business for free. And, and the other thing about Amazon is that Amazon this year will, will bypass UPS as the deliver more packages in the US than, or worldwide than UPS does. And, uh, and UPS has been around 100 years. And Amazon will build more warehouse space this year, uh, 122 million square feet, to put that in perspective. Walmart has, if my memory is correct, 136 million square feet, and Walmart's been around 50 years, and Amazon came public in 1996. So we, we think that Amazon actually is a very, a very good value here because the free cash flow should explode over the next few years as this capital spending cycle wears down. You mentioned buying Amazon at the IPO. An another uh, company that you bought at the IPO with very unusual initial public offering was Google. So, you know, what's your current assessment of Google? It's our second largest holding. What we, Alphabet, we like, I should say, yeah. We, 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 we like it a lot. Um, it's got a lot of momentum right now in terms of the, the, the business. It's a core holding for us, and I, I think it, it will continue to be. So there is such a thing as a core holding, at least at Miller Value Partners. <laughs> well, core in the sense that we've owned it a long time. Yeah. And, and we haven't seen a reason from a valuation perspective to sell it. In some cases where we have sold things that went up a lot and we thought were expensive, Netflix being the most prominent example where, you know, we, it, we, we bought it on the old stock at eight, we sold it at 32 and thought we were smart and then it went to 300. <laughs> then it collapsed to the 50s, we bought it again in the 50s, then it went up 12 times in the next two years. And then we sold it after that, and I think now it's up about 10 times since then. So it would have been better just to leave it alone. Facebook Meta, what, what's your assessment of that company at this particular juncture? I don't have a view about, uh, Mark Zuckerberg clearly has a view about where their future lies, and that's in the so-called metaverse, that's why they're right. changing their name, this kind of integration of, of uh, uh, the digital world and the, and the real world. And, and clearly there's a, there's a ton of stuff that's going to happen in that, you know, in that space. Um, I, I think that you know, the, the market understands what the issues are with, with Meta from the, from the standpoint of all of the concerns about the power of social networks, the harm that they've done. I think that those issues are real. Um, but the stock price reflects it. So if the stock price didn't reflect it, I'd be a lot more concerned about it. But you know, the valuations have come in uh, a, a lot. They still generate a ton of cash. They have three billion users worldwide, so no one's ever going to overtake them. And I think that there's, you know, and th they keep talking about more regulation, saying they like it, and in, in a perverse way, part of what more regulation would do for somebody like Meta is it would keep the newer competitors and crowd them out. Alibaba, you know, just speaking of a, a company that has come under uh, scrutiny uh, in its home market in China, has been, you know, certainly the stock price has been affected uh, by that and regulation from the Chinese authorities, and yet you continue to own it in a, you know, fairly sizable position in it. Why? Yeah, we, we, we bought a, a chunk of it when, when the, all of the... Um, Stories broke about about Jack Ma. And he disappeared for a while. Mm -hmm. There's still stories ev every day. There's a, you know a, a story today about the common prosperity that President President Xi wants and the new regulations for things like Didi and gig workers and all of that is real. We don't know how far that's going to go, but right now the the market price in my in my opinion fully reflects that in Alibaba, for example, because it trades now about 15 times uh, uh, the next 12 months earnings. And we, we think the company's going to, growth is going to slow, but it would be surprising to us if over the next three years they couldn't grow at least 15% a year, generate a lot of cash, still have a dominant market position. How do you deal with these political uncertainties? There's a couple aspects to that. Uh, the, the first one is we, we really try and understand 
based on what we know now about what the economic impact of those measures will have on these companies. So how will it affect their earnings growth? I mean, Alibaba was growing 25% a year to 30% a year for a long time, and now it's going to be growing a lot less than that. Mm -hmm. But again, that's now reflected in the, in the price. Uh, and then the other, the other part of it um, might have said, or if I didn't, I should have said that since the financial crisis, people have been volatility and risk phobic. And so they, wherever they see perceived risk, uh, they flee from it because of the experience of the losses in the great financial crisis of 08 and 09. So our, our default position is that people will overestimate perceived risk uh, and, uh, and the real risk is, is, tends to be much less. And especially when there's a lot of headline risk about these companies. You know, we, we had a big position in Facebook some years ago when Mark Zuckerberg was dragged before Congress and we went over to see clients over in, over in Europe and, and they asked us about it and one of the things that we said, well, what, what are your other managers doing? And he said, well, they're all getting rid of it. And, uh, and that, tur that turned out to be that week of it, it turned out to be the bottom and, and then Facebook's price. So we've, you know, Al Alibaba is, uh, was 300 uh, a year ago and, uh, and now it's 120. So that, that, that come down uh, reduces a lot of risk in, uh, in, the, in that name and, and other names in that space. I think the, the concern for us would be that something would happen that happened with the education companies where the party just, just you know, turned them into nonprofits. Shut them down. Uber. Uh, you, you still own some Uber, right? Yes. Yeah. What's the appeal of Uber? I think, you know, Uber's, if, if we do a sum of the parts on Uber, we get a, a price that's pretty comfortably double the current, double uh -huh. the current price. Under, under Dara, uh, whom we know well, they, um, they, the, the culture there is, is changing. In fact, has changed a great deal, but still may continue to change from a culture that was pretty toxic. Mm -hmm. they, they're EBITDA profitable now, and I think that that's, that's going to continue. We think that Uber Eats is a very valuable part of the, the business. So it's, it's the same story, really, with all of our companies. We try and come up with what we call a central tendency of value, and if that central tendency of value is a lot higher than the current stock price, then it certainly is worth, uh, you know, worth taking a very serious look at and, and maybe buying. Financials, value investors are, are well known for buying financials. So talk to us about, you know, Capital One and One Main, J.P. Morgan, Bank of America, Citigroup. You own all of them. Yes, uh, we, we think that financials are among the most attractive stocks in the, in the market. And the financials, just calling them by a single name uh, is misleading in itself. It is. Some companies, you know, benefit <laughs> from rising rates. Some are harmed by rising rates. Some benefit from faster growth. Some are harmed by faster growth. Uh, the, accounting, the accounting needs to be taken into account because there's many different ways to account for things in, uh, in financials. But, uh, you know, Capital One the other day uh, eliminated overdrafts for their customers, something that Elizabeth Warren has been, has been calling out for. And uh, other companies are doing that. Uh, others aren't doing it. But I do think that that's, I, Rich Fairbanks would not do that if, uh, uh, if, if he thought that would, that would be a significant impairment to their, to their uh, business. Mm -hmm. So I think they, they've taken a look at it. And just, just when Amazon, you know, every few years, every three years or so or four years, they, they raise the price of Prime pretty significantly. And they do that because they deliver a lot more value to the customers and they're confident the customers won't flee. And I think it's probably the same thing that the, the overdrafts aren't a big part of the profitability of, of, of Capital One. Um, you know, Bank of America, we think is very cheap. We think Brian Moynihan's done a great job there. Citi is trading below tangible book value, which makes no sense because the, the book value is a tangible book value. is a pretty good estimation of what, what the assets are actually worth. And very few companies of that size and scope uh, would trade below their tangible book value in an environment like this. So we think there's a legacy taint in Citi, which, which we think the new CEO will, will uh, gradually, we, we like what she's doing, so think that that will gradually attenuate. They're all going to buy back a ton of stock. Uh -huh. They're all of the strongest capital positions they've had in history. So you can expect that, you know, between stock buybacks and dividend growth, the total return uh, thing in very modest valuations compared to the market that it looks very very good for those financials. General Motors. T talk to us about uh, General Motors and and why you are uh, pretty positive about GM's outlook. I thought that GM's general strategy was sound. I think that um, Mary Barra, the, the the CEO, has done right. a really nice job strategically and operationally. She's been there a long time. Um, but for us, the, I think that the trigger for uh, getting into General Motors in a much, a much bigger way, we've owned it off and on in the past, not terribly successfully, um, because the, the auto industry is one of overcapitalization and typically not earning above the cost of capital through a cycle. Mm -hmm. The pandemic changed that, and it, it really accelerated the strategic change 
and the decision procedures uh, at I think at all the big all the big auto companies. And when, but when they hired Paul Jacobson as the CFO uh, from Delta, uh, we we knew him for a long time. We were we owned Delta stock when it was in the single digits, and and he was still I think, do. Yeah, we right. know he still do. Paul was a very creative uh, CFO. He, he he you know got the airline to buy an oil refinery and. Uh, they typically had a reputation, correctly in my opinion, for being a, a high quality airline with a very strong balance sheet. It's the only major carrier not to dilute you with equity offerings during the, during the pandemic. And I think that was you know, a large part of the legacy that, that he had. But he had indicated to the company, he'd been there 10 years as a CFO and still a young guy in his late 40s. And he just, he wanted a different challenge. And uh, he thought that his work was mostly done there. And um, so I, I talked to him when, uh, when, uh, GM was, when he was considering going to GM, there hadn't been an announcement yet. And um, I said, well, I'm, I'm, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure that you wouldn't be talking to GM unless, unless you were confident that Mary uh, and the board would let you uh, do your thing as a CFO. And, uh, and he said, that's exactly right. And he said, I, I'm, I'm confident in the strategy. I think we know how to create value. And the, the new strategic goals they set out in their analyst day a, a short while ago uh, amount to the, the revenues over the next you know 10 years or so growing at about three times what they've grown at before with a large portion of that being subscription based revenues so it's it's pretty easy to see GM's multiple expanding uh, dramatically if they're successful in that as mm -hmm. I think they will be one of the stocks that is a surprise that you have in your portfolio is Tupperware so what's the situation with Tupperware yeah I think probably anybody who's under 40 years old, they might have heard the name, but they don't have the product. Um, whereas people of my generation, I think everybody's got Tupperware in there, somewhere right. in their kitchen. Um, but the, what, the key there is that they got a, a, a new senior management team. Uh, right when the pandemic started, Miguel Fernandez, who had been at uh, Avon, and, and so we got to know him at, at Avon, and we made a lot of money with Avon when, when uh, he and the other management team came in there. They, they, they sold Avon to Natura, and he came over and, and took over Tupperware and is implementing the same strategy that he did at, at Avon. A few years ago, Tupperware was a $70 stock, and today it's under $16. But they've cleaned up the balance sheet, and uh, they've, they've liquefied some of their land holdings around Orlando where they're, where they're based. And their share repo program that they announced a quarter or so ago is, is to buy back 25% of their stock, which is a very large number, but mm -hmm. a great value at this price. Give me the name of, of a, a company that you own uh, that you think has tremendous potential that is not being recognized? We have a, a, a pretty good sized position in Splunk, which has been a real laggard, mm -hmm. um, but it's growing its cloud. So it's in a transformation to a, a cloud-based subscription model and, that, and, the, and, and their, so their annual recurring revenues are growing very rapidly and their cloud business is growing. And, but the, making that transition uh, is, is, is causing, you know, there's a forces moving in opposite directions. When other companies have done it, like Adobe, for example, it's, it, they've had a period of underperformance, and then once it's clear that's going to work, uh, the predictability of the business model becomes much, much greater because, again, it's, it's subscription-based, perhaps even more so, more controversial. Um, although Splunk's pretty controversial, is, uh, is Varum, which is the competitor to Carvana in getting, uh, selling used cars uh, directly to consumers over the Internet, and you know, so not going to dealerships. So Carvana uh, has, has been a spectacular leader in that. And Varun, when they came public a year or two ago, many people, including me, thought that their business model was superior to Carvana's. They were about three years behind just in market penetration. But they, they stumbled out of the box with some, with some uh, issues with, say, with service. And, uh, and then the, the, the customer experience wasn't what it ought to be. And so they're tackling all that. But I think the management there, we think the management there is quite good. Uh, they, the management there, many of them came from bookings.com, which is a, more than a $60 billion company. And it did the same thing for, for hotel bookings and travel that, that we think that Varum is doing. I think it was in the, in the 60s a while back, and now it's, now it's 14 or 15. And it's way below the IPO price. So that, that's when I think if you're patient, it's going to be a couple of years before they make any money. But the market is so gigantic there that um, there's room for a lot of players. I'm listening to you, Bill. You know, 40 years in in the investment business, uh, and you're still as enthusiastic about what you're doing. It's very infectious, and you keep finding these uh, really interesting companies that other people are not valuing the way you think they should be. Um, 
What happened to the uh, the generic drug companies that you were had been invested in a couple of years ago that came under scrutiny? There were several things. So um, Teva bought um, the generics business of, I'm just drawing a blank on it right now. That's right. But they paid like 18 times cash flow, and it was one of the worst deals uh, in, in history. And they levered up with $30 billion worth of debt to do it. And they did that right when right when generic prices were collapsing uh, because there's a lot of competition in the generic in the generic space and there was a lot of co consolidation one level above that at the drug distributors who were then were then uh, pressuring the generic companies to cut price and then wrapped up with that was the opioid uh, uh, crisis there are a lot of generic versions of, of various you know oxycontin and that that kind of stuff that was out there and so they were sued. I mean, the whole industry was was sued, not just not just the generic drug companies. And and, and Purdue was the was the uh, poster child for the bad behavior, which of course they went bankrupt and had a big, and still did a big settlement. Mm -hmm. So the upshot of it is that um, now these things are winding through the courts, and Teva has a brand new management team, which again we think is is outstanding. And operationally, they're doing all the right things. They're starting to grow again for the first time in couple of years, and they trade it around uh, three and a half times earnings and with a 20% free cash flow yield. And the, and the reason that they do is because the uncertainty of these lawsuits, and while, while product liability lawsuits rarely bankrupt anybody, um, they have done it in the past with the asbestos companies, for, for example. So it's not, it's not impossible that, that could happen, but it's very unlikely mm -hmm. uh, in this case with somebody like Teva, which is also an Israeli-based company, which is a, you know, it's, an, it's a national champion over in in Israel. Israel, and one out of every, I think it's one out of every nine prescriptions in the United States is a Teva product. So they're not, they're not going away, and they're, right. they're, they are paying down debt, and so that the balance sheet gets stronger every year, and we would expect any settlement, even if it was at, at big numbers like people are, are talking about, would stretch out over 10 or 15 years, and so would not be, would not be threatening. And if that settlement happens, so we, we think if no settlement happens and they keep litigating it in, in the courts, then the debt pay down alone of Teva with the modest revenue growth would get you, you know, maybe 12 to 15 percent a year, which which we think will be about double what the market can do. If the lawsuits are settled, if there's a, if there's a class action settlement, then then we think Teva's up 50 percent that day and probably 100 percent within a year. One investment for a long term diversified portfolio. And I'm going to tell you the last time you were on, which was about a year and a half ago, it was Amazon, which is up uh, 25 percent since you recommended it. What would, what would your one investment pick be today? Well, you see this hat that I'm putting on? <laughs> you have a prop. Yeah, that's a Bitcoin hat. <laughs> and so I would say, I would say um, Bitcoin. Uh, and without getting into all of the nuances of Bitcoin, I, I would just say that I've owned Bitcoin. I started buying it around $200 a, a share, and it's now $56,000 a share. And I think that there is still enormous growth. There's about 120 million people who have Bitcoin wallets in the world. And that's about the size the internet was in 1997. Wow. And, you know, Amazon came public in 1996, Google in 2004, and Facebook in 2012. So the adoption cycle here is very, very early, early days. And I think that, I think that, that Bitcoin, uh, it's, it's basically, we think of it right now as digital gold, because it, it, it's a store of value like gold is, but it's, it's easily transportable, which gold is not. And so uh, we think that it's, it will ultimately overtake the market cap of gold, which is about $10 trillion right now, and Bitcoin's about $1 trillion. I, I heard a good argument about why you wouldn't put 1% of your liquid assets in Bitcoin. And if Bitcoin goes to zero, and it's much less likely to do that when it was five years ago or seven years ago, uh, and it'll be less likely in five years or more, if I'm right about it. But even if it does go to zero, you can afford to lose 1%. Bill Miller, thank you so much for being on Wealth Track. It's always a pleasure having you. And incidentally, we will be doing another show with you on Bitcoin specifically. So we have that to look forward to as well. Thanks, Bill. Thanks, Consuelo. And always a pleasure to uh, come on your show. At the close of every wealth track, we usually give you one suggestion to help you build and protect your wealth over the long term. But we are breaking with that tradition this week 
to get into the spirit of holiday giving and Bill Miller's proclivity to think unconventionally. It is read the new book, The Last King of America, The Misunderstood Reign of George III by British historian Andrew Roberts. Roberts, a superb historian and writer, had access to a trove of archival material, which reveals a very different George III than the evil despot portrayed in American history and the unhinged one portrayed in Britain. Roberts reveals him as an enlightened, educated, and cultured leader who defended his own and Parliament's constitutional powers, but who also suffered from a serious mental illness, which did him in in the end. He deserves a fair hearing. Andrew Roberts gives him one. Next week, financial risk expert Rick Bookstaber discusses the new market risk challenging investors. If you are so inclined, please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and our YouTube channel. Have a Merry Christmas, a wonderful holiday season, and make the week ahead a healthy, profitable, and a productive one.